afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Sastasis, and uh, on behalf of the Governing Council of the uh, Hellenic Astronomical Society, uh, I would like to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Panopoulou. Uh, it's actually uh, a proud moment for me, right, because uh, Gina is uh, my first academic child. So uh, Gina uh, did her undergrad uh, studies here in Crete, uh, as well as her PhD uh, in 2017. And uh, after that, she moved uh, to a postdoctoral appointment at um, Cal the California Institute of Technology, uh, where uh, in 2019, uh, she was awarded the Hubble Fellowship, NASA's Hubble Fellowship, and she stayed at Caltech. Uh, and uh, recently, she has been, uh, she, she is transitioning, right, to an assistant professor position at the Chalmers University in Sweden. Uh, despite the, um, the young age, uh, Gina has several accolades. Uh, so she was uh, awarded the uh, Young Researcher Award by the University of Crete. And uh, in 2017, also, uh, she got the uh, best PhD prize award by uh, the, the International Astronomical Union Division H. Uh, her work uh, is related to uh, magnetism in the interstellar medium. And uh, today, we'll hear all about uh, the observational side of it. Uh, Zina, you have the floor. Thank you, Costa. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. It's great to see you all. Uh, let me know if the noise uh, becomes too large or, you know, if the volume is fine. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very excited to talk to you all about observations of magnetic fields in the interstellar medium of our own galaxy and of other galaxies as well. I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful work uh, and help that I've uh, received from uh, a number of colleagues. Um, and I'd like to highlight in particular the work of Sam Panada, who's a grad student at, at Caltech now in his third year. So let me start off with um, a brief outline. We'll first look at the need for mapping magnetic field geometries in the ISM, what kind of problems we can solve by using this tool. We'll then look at the current status of observations in the Milky Way and also in nearby galaxies. And I'll end with an outlook uh, looking into the future. So magnetic fields are really a ubiquitous component uh, in the plasmas that make up the universe. Um, for an example close to our heart is the Earth's magnetic field that shields us from uh, dangerous radiation. For example, cosmic rays coming from the solar wind get trapped uh, in the magnetic field lines and they get um, channeled. Some of them get channeled into the poles of the Earth. Uh, to the atmosphere. And th that's how we get uh, spectacular displays of northern lights like the one you're seeing on your screen right now. But this is just one example of an astrophysical system that has a magnetic field. Um, other examples are shown here on the screen. We know that um, magnetic fields are crucial to the phenomenology of very energetic phenomena. For example, in supernova remnants, the magnetic fields act to accelerate particles, cosmic rays, uh, at relativistic speeds. And on the other end of the scale, uh, around supermassive black holes, magnetic fields act to channel material from the accretion disk out to uh, thousands and thousands of parsecs away from the galaxy and these powerful jets that you're seeing on the right here. But in both supernova remnants and AGNs, the magnetic field is just along for the ride. It's not a dynamical player in the system. But there is one astrophysical system where the magnetic field plays a dynamically important role, and that is the ISM. So in the interstellar medium, if you go out and measure the mean uh, energy density of different components of the ISM in the neighborhood of the sun, um, the interstellar magnetic field has an energy density that is comparable to the other forms of energy that there exist. For example, the thermal hot gas uh, kinetic energy, the kinetic turbulent energy, the cosmic ray energy, and so on. 
And in the recent years, we've had a spectacular array of observations that are showing us the effect of magnetic fields on, say, the formation of stars in the solar neighborhood. What you're seeing here on the right is an image of a nearby molecular cloud. This is the Taurus star forming region. The background colors are showing you thermal dust emission and the lines, this pattern that's overlaid are the magnetic field lines. And by looking at these observations in detail, we've come to an understanding that magnetic fields shape the interstellar medium structure. For example, if you zoom in on these dense star forming filaments that you're seeing here, um, on the bottom, you're seeing a Herschel image of the dust emission of this star forming filament in Taurus. We find that magnetic fields are able to channel flows to these dense star forming regions and also shape diffuse filamentary structures in the outskirts of molecular clouds. And because the magnetic field is able to impose an asymmetry, an axis along which flows are easier to happen, this affects the kinematics in non-trivial ways. But this statement that the magnetic energy density is comparable to other energy densities is scale dependent. It's condition dependent and environment dependent. And understanding where and when the magnetic field is a dominant contributor to the energy balance is really the name of the game in interstellar medium research in terms of magnetic fields. So we still don't know in detail how the energy balance changes with respect to, say, location in the galaxy. What I'm showing you here on the right is a plot from a simulation of a Milky Way type galaxy that includes magnetic fields and cosmic rays from the suite of fire simulations that I'll also mention in uh, the next slides. The y-axis is showing you the pressure of different um, components of the ISM, and the x-axis is the gas density. So at the solar circle within the midplane of the galaxy, it turns out that different lines, uh, different components of the ISM cross. So for example, you can see the green dot dashed line shows the pressure of the cosmic rays. These are the cosmic rays of order a GV uh, that contribute to the bulk of the energy density in the ISM. And this cosmic ray pressure is more or less flat with volume density. At the same time, the thermal kinetic energy is down here in this dotted line and rises at about, to meet this cosmic ray line at about a few particles per cc for this simulation. And that density is also where the magnetic pressure comes to meet the other two lines, which is the solid orange line that you're seeing here. But you can see that if we move to higher densities or lower densities, the energy balance is going to change. So we need observations to be able to constrain as a function of density, as a function of environment, as a function of location in the galaxy, or even galaxy type, how this energy balance plays. And in order to probe this energy balance between the magnetic energy and other energy densities, the best way we have is to look at the geometry of the magnetic field. So the geometry of the magnetic field holds um, a number that we can actually uh, connect to for understanding this energy balance. And this number is the Alfenmach number shown here. This is really just the ratio between the RMS velocity fluctuations and the Alfen velocity, which is the speed at which magnetic perturbations propagate in the ISM. So this is a measure of the balance between the kinetic energy in turbulent motions and the magnetic energy. And if you take an idealized setup, assume that your gas is cold and isothermal uh, in a periodic box and set up a, a turbulent uh, initial condition with a magnetic field, depending on the strength of the magnetic field that you input, you end up with a very different result. The top panel here on the right is showing you a simulation with a magnetic field that's uh, initial conditions are, are strong. So it's, um, it's dominant compared to the kinetic energy. And in this case, the magnetic field lines you can see are straight and parallel. These are the black lines that you're seeing overlaid on the density image. The other extreme is when the magnetic field is input as subdominant to the kinetic energy. So here, in this case, the magnetic field lines that are overlaid in black are jumbled and tangled. So you can see how 
the amount of order in the magnetic field is a probe of how important the magnetic field is compared to, in this case, kinetic energy in turbulent motions. So by looking at the geometry of the magnetic field, we can infer things about the energy balance between the different components of the ISM. And by mapping the geometry, we can solve even bigger questions. So I'll give you three examples of big questions we can solve by mapping in detail, as a function of scale, the structure of the magnetic field. The first question we can look at is understanding the evolution of the magnetic field itself. So we know that magnetic fields exist in galaxies, but despite this knowledge, we still don't have a fully developed theory of how these magnetic fields evolve over time, how they are sustained, and how they are shaped. We know that there are processes that act on a variety of scales that contribute to the structuring of the magnetic fields. On one extreme, on kiloparsec and more scales, we have global processes like galactic rotation. And this we know uh, observationally by looking at galaxies like M51, which shows a magnetic field pattern here overlaid in white lines that follows the spiral structure of the galaxy. On the other regime, on the other end of scales, on scales of hundreds of parsecs or less, stellar feedback is another process that acts to shape the magnetic field in the ISM. For example, here you're seeing a nearby superbubble, the Orion Eridana superbubble, here in the Milky Way, where the magnetic field lines are draped around the surface of this cavity that's been carved by the action of uh, massive stars. So by mapping the magnetic field geometry in a range of scales, you can see how the different components that uh, act in the ISM have shaped the magnetic field and the energy balance. The second question where mapping magnetic fields is important is in cosmic ray physics. Now, cosmic rays come in all different varieties. They span lots of, lots of orders of magnitude and energy, the lowest energy particles of order a GeV are um, the ones that contribute the maximum to the total pressure in the ISM that comes from cosmic rays. And these charged energetic particles have um, happen to uh, have gyro radii of order an AU in the magnetic field of the, of the Milky Way. Their um, trajectories are, are spirals, um, they emit polarized radiation that we'll see later, and their propagation in the ISM is a complicated open question that relies on understanding the structure of the magnetic field and its fluctuations. And on the other extreme of energy, uh, we find ultra high energy cosmic rays. These are, these are the highest energy particles known in the universe with energies of 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 20 EV. And we still don't know what mechanism is responsible for accelerating particles to these crazy energies. These particles have gyro radii that exceed the, the sizes of, of uh, galaxies. And the main problem, because we, uh, the reason why we still don't know what kinds of sources accelerate them is because as they are emitted and traverse intergalactic and galactic space, their trajectories are deflected by the magnetic fields they encounter. So if we knew the structure and properties of the magnetic field in the Milky Way, then we could correct for this deflection and find these uh, ultra high energy particle sources. And the final question where mapping magnetic fields in detail in the ISM is important, in particular in our own galaxy, has to do with cosmology and the cosmic microwave background. So it's been predicted by inflationary theories that the light from the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, is polarized at a level that's low, but that um, is probing gravitational waves that existed in the epoch of inflation. To measure this very faint pattern of polarization in this light from the Big Bang, we need to solve a difficult problem. And this problem is to separate the emission that comes from the early universe from the emission that comes from our own Milky Way's magnetic field. Here on the right, I'm showing you two maps at microwave frequencies of two different emission mechanisms that are produced within the Milky Way due to its magnetic field. 
the top shows you emission from polarized dust, and the bottom shows you emission from synchrotron. Now, mapping magnetic fields in our own Milky Way in three dimensions has proven crucial to be able to accurately model this foreground emission and subtract it from the cosmic microwave background. So for all these reasons, we are very excited to uh, try and map the galactic magnetic field structure, not only in our own Milky Way, but also in other galaxies. And now I'll just uh, briefly mention how we're uh, able to observe the geometry of the magnetic field, and we'll delve into what the observations uh, are telling us for the Milky Way. Then we'll look at nearby galaxies. So first off, we have two ways of measuring the geometry of the magnetic field. The first method is through synchrotron emission. The cosmic ray electrons that I mentioned before spiral around magnetic field lines and emit polarized radiation in a direction that's perpendicular to the projected magnetic field on the plane of the sky. The intensity of this polarized light is an integral along the line of sight of the magnetic field strength the component that's parallel to the plane of sky, to some power, mu uh, multiplied by the density of the cosmic ray electrons. So by looking at the radio frequencies where this synchrotron emission is bright, you can map out the structure of the magnetic field as projected on the plane of the sky. The second method we have to probe the magnetic field geometry relies on interstellar dust. So dust in the ISM is aspherical, and it tends to align with its short axis parallel to magnetic field lines. When these dust grains emit, their thermal radiation is linearly polarized in the direction parallel to the long axis of the grain. So if you map the far infrared uh, polarized light from these dust grains, you find uh, an E vector that is perpendicular to the magnetic field uh, projected on the plane of the sky. At the same time, at optical wavelengths, these dust grains absorb light from background stars, and they impose a polarization to this background starlight that is parallel to the magnetic field. The amount of polarization, the intensity of the polarization, is again um, an integral along the line of sight for the emission of the density of dust grains, some parameters that have to do with intrinsic uh, properties of the dust, and the geometry of the magnetic field. These angles here are telling you the inclination of the magnetic field with respect to the line of sight, and also with respect to the plane of the sky, so the orientation on the plane of the sky. So we have these two different methods to map the magnetic field geometry, and these have been used to constrain models of what the magnetic field looks like in the entire galaxy, in the Milky Way. But we have a situation where the models that we have disagree and disagree fundamentally. Here I'm showing you three of the most popularly, uh, most used models of the Milky Way's magnetic field. We are an observer placed above the center of the galaxy, looking at it face on. You can see that these um, models have qualitative differences. The colors are showing you the strength of the magnetic field and the vectors are showing you the local direction of the magnetic field. Now the model on the left doesn't have spiral arms and the ones that do uh, disagree on pretty much everything else. Now the reason why we're stuck with these very uncertain models of the Milky Way's magnetic field is because we've been using limitation, limited data for uh, constraining these models. And the limitation in the data is that they are primarily two dimensional. So we've been using maps like the synchrotron map that I'm showing you here to constrain an inherently three-dimensional vector field. And in order to make progress, in order to make better models, better representations of the magnetic field, we need to recover that missing line of sight dimension, that missing third dimension. And we live in a very fortunate time because we have now the opportunity to start doing this. And the opportunity comes in the form of starlight polarization. Now, I mentioned that the same dust grains that produce polarized thermal emission are also responsible for the polarization of stars. And over here on the left, I'm showing you a two-dimensional uh, map 
of the magnetic field projected on the plane of the sky uh, as traced by individual stellar uh, measurements. The polarization angle of the stars is shown um, with these white lines, and this is the magnetic field that we trace for each sightline. Now, in recent years, ESA's mission Gaia has delivered distances to each of these stars. We now have distances through the method of parallax for billions of stars in the galaxy. And what this means is that for the first time, we can accurately deproject this two-dimensional uh, field along the line of sight. And this is what we've started to do. So stellar polarization allows us to regain some of the missing, missing three-dimensional information. Because a star's light uh, starts out typically unpolarized, most stars have unpolarized light, this light propagates through a magnetized and dusty medium and acquires a polarization due to the magnetic field only out to the distance of the star. So if you have, say, a line of sight as simple as this with one dominant cloud with a magnetic field in, oriented in this way, if you sort the, polar, the stars according to distance and plot their polarization angles, foreground stars are going to be unpolarized, not tracing the magnetic field of this medium. Background stars are going to show a polarization that's parallel to the magnetic field. And this allows you to map the geometry of the magnetic field in a tomographic sense, in slices of distance. We've started to do this with uh, existing data. I'm showing you here an example of a very bright radio feature of the synchrotron sky. The um, uh, feature is known as a North Polar Spur. Most of you must have heard of it. And if I zoom in on this uh, panel here, I'm showing you the polarized intensity of the synchrotron emission in the background. The red lines are this two-dimensional observable of the magnetic field. They're showing the magnetic field direction inferred from measuring the polarization of synchrotron. And the yellow lines are showing you individual stellar polarization uh, data. So by comparing the stellar polarization with the synchrotron, we can ask and answer questions like, where along the line of sight is this emission coming from? Where is this magnetic field orientation located? So we did this by comparing the polarization angle of the stars, theta star, to the polarization uh, angle, the magnetic field angle inferred from the synchrotron, which is phi, phi here, um, as a function of stellar distance. You can see at small distances, the angle differences are large. But as you go to 100 parsecs or more, the two angles, the two magnetic field tracers, align. And what this means is that this emission that we're seeing, the synchrotron emission, its polarization is arising from a structure at about 100 parsecs. And after that, the magnetic field direction doesn't seem to be changing much. But of course, not all sight lines are going to be as simple as this, as having only one dominant component of the magnetic field. So we want to generalize this. We want to look at sight lines with an arbitrary number of clouds, with different orientations in each cloud. So let's take this um, a level up in, in complexity and look at a sideline that has two clouds that overlap on the plane of the sky. In this case, stars that are nearby, foreground to both clouds, are going to be unpolarized. Stars that are in between the two clouds will only show polarization due to the first cloud. And stars that are behind both clouds will show a polarization due to the combined effect of the magnetic field in cloud one and in cloud two. And in the diffuse ISM, we expect that the polarization parameters, the Stokes parameters that describe the magnetic field properties are piecewise constant functions of the distance to, uh, from the Earth. We've demonstrated this tomographic technique in a first application back in 2019 with real data. And recently, Vincent Pelgrims from the University of Crete has developed a fully uh, automated Bayesian methodology to solve this problem for an arbitrary number of sight lines. So I'll be showing you the results from this um, pathfinding survey where we were able to decompose the magnetic field orientation as a function of distance for uh, a particular sight line that looks a lot like this cartoon. It has two clouds along the line of sight. 
along the sideline, we measured um, the polarization of hundreds of stars in this small circle here, and also in a neighbor neighboring region. Uh, we used Robopol, which is um, the workforce instrument from, from Skinakas, measuring polarization of stars um, for over a decade now, for almost a decade. Um, we uh, measured these polarizations of the stars, and the star distances range from nearby to uh, out to a couple kiloparsecs, uh, probing the inner halo, the transition between the midplane of the disk and uh, the outer parts. So the tomographic decomposition uh, shows us this result. On the left, I'm showing you the column density of the nearby cloud as traced by H1, neutral hydrogen emission. And overlaid, I'm showing you the orientation of the magnetic field that we observe from this tomographic method using the stellar polarizations and Gaia distances. And at the same time, this faraway cloud that is in the same region of space um, projected on the sky, but much, much larger distances, has a magnetic field orientation that we infer from this tomographic method that's 60 degrees off from the magnetic field of the nearby cloud. So by using this method in this very simple um, isolated example, we were able to map the orientation of the magnetic field out to one kpc above, above the midplane of the galaxy, out to the transition between the disk and the halo. We would love to do this for not just for one sideline, but uh, the entire sky, but we are limited by the available data. So here I'm showing you the current status of how many stellar polarization measurements we have in the optical as a function of sky location. This is a galactic uh, coordinate map. So mid plane of the galaxy is in the center. Um, and the colors are showing you the number of polarization measurements we have for each pixel of this map of the sky. Gray means there are zero polarization measurements. Black means there is one, et cetera. And you can see that most of the sky has less than one stellar polarization measurement. But in order to do this tomographic mapping, we need hundreds of stellar polarization measurements. And in order to do this, we need a survey. And that's where the PASIFY survey comes in. PASIFY is a survey that's planned for the next few years. It's led off from the University of Crete uh, by Costas Tassis, and it's a collaboration between a number of partner institutions. Our aim is to map the optical polarization of stars first in these um, half of the sky areas that I'm showing you in dark. So with PASIFY, we'll be able to have millions and millions of stellar polarization data available. If you haven't heard of PASIFY, and even if you have, I urge you to go look at our website and explore all the amazing science that we'll be able to do. The amount of data that we expect is just tremendously uh, exciting. Here I'm showing you the number of stars with stellar polarization measurements ever since the detection of starlight polarization because of the ISM in the 40s out to the projected um, end of the first run of the survey in 2027. And just in the next five years or so, four or five years, um, BASIFI is going to deliver a three orders of magnitude increase in the number of stars with measured polarization that are available for magnetic field mapping. BASIFI is going to run uh, using two one meter class telescopes, one in the Northern Hemisphere at Skinakas Observatory and the other in the Southern Hemisphere at South Africa. Both telescopes have committed a substantial amount of time for the survey to happen, and each of them is going to be equipped with a novel, sensitive, high accuracy, wide field polarimeter. These polarimeters are called wallops. They are designed by um, members of the Pacify collaboration, and what you're seeing here on the left is a 3D rendering of the optical design of the wallop south polarimeter. The light from the telescope comes in through this beam. The polarization optics over here split the light into four separate polarization states that are imaged each on a different separate CCD. So with this design, wallops are able to measure the Stokes parameters in a single shot with no moving parts 
and within a very wide field of view. And this allows us to cover large swaths of the sky very quickly and also ensures instrument stability. Wallops are not just amazingly um, sensitive instruments, they also have the very wide field of view that's necessary to cover um, this large patch of the sky that we need to cover. The control of instrumental systematics is really unprecedented for wide field optical polarimetry. The uh, instruments are going to deliver 0.1% systematic uncertainties throughout the field of view. And uh, we're very excited to see where this takes us. So by using Pacify, we'll be able to really revolutionize the way that we see the Milky Way's magnetic field, much like the way that photometric surveys in combination with Gaia have revolutionized the way that we map the structure of the Milky Way itself, of the ISM. Over here on the left, you're seeing um, a model that we had for the Milky Way's spiral structure. And on the right is an actual reconstruction based on the photometric data combined with Gaia, where you can see the dust lanes in red highlighting segments of spiral arms around the sun, which is placed at the center. So this kind of 3D reconstruction is what we're aiming to get with using Pacify data in the next years. But of course, the Milky Way is not the only galaxy. And if we want to learn about magnetic fields throughout cosmic time, throughout the universe, we want to look not only at our own Milky Way in great detail, but also to other systems, to nearby galaxies, so that we can map the magnetic field on a range of scales and environments. So now I'm going to transition to looking at the magnetic fields in nearby galaxies. The uh, magnetic fields of other galaxies uh, have been mapped primarily using radio synchrotron emission. Over here, you're seeing the magnetic field of uh, IC342, a nearby spiral galaxy, overlaid in white lines on the total intensity of the synchrotron emission. And what's a predominant feature in these magnetic field maps is that the spiral pattern is uh, reflected also in the magnetic field. So lots of galaxies show magnetic arms and large-scale ordered fields that are best explained by the action of the mean field dynamo. But what's really exciting in recent years is that now we have two independent ways of tracing the magnetic field geometry in different phases of the ISM. Over here, I'm showing you a map of M51. The center image is showing you the map of the magnetic field using synchrotron emission from the radio. And on the left, you're seeing this new tracer that exists, far infrared polarization, which is just mapping the thermal dust emission that we discussed earlier, only now doing it for a nearby galaxy. The radio traces the cosmic ray electrons, which are uh, primarily associated with diffuse gas, whereas the far infrared traces the denser, colder regions of the ISM. So by comparing the geometries and the polarization properties in these two very different wavelengths, you can assess the three-dimensional statistical properties of the magnetic field across the different phases of the ISM for the first time in other galaxies. And not only the geometry, but also the amount of polarization allows us to infer 3D properties of the magnetic field. Over here, I'm showing you the polarization fraction of the far infrared emission as a function of column density. And what you're seeing is an anti-correlation, and this is the same data that I showed you in the previous slide of M51. Now, the amount of polarization goes down as you go to denser environments, and we infer that the reason is magnetic fields become more and more tangled as you go to higher densities. At the same time, for this spiral galaxy, the radio data, the radio polarization fraction in the bottom is flat with column density, meaning that the uh, medium that's been traced by the cosmic rays does not have um, a high order of tangledness. It has a magnetic field that's ordered. But of course, spiral galaxies are not the only kind of galaxy. In fact, most galaxies are dwarf galaxies. And so we wanted to explore how the magnetic fields in spirals compare to that of dwarf galaxies. So what we did is to propose to Sophia to observe the magnetic field in a nearby dwarf galaxy, IC10. What I'm showing you here is the first such map of the far infrared polarization of a dwarf galaxy. 
the colors are showing you the intensity of the far infrared radiation, and the magnetic field lines are overlaid in white. The scales we're probing here are 50 to 500 parsecs or so. And we can compare this magnetic field geometry that we infer by uh, looking at the radio as well. So here is what we've, uh, uh, we've seen recently. On the left is the polarized intensity for the far infrared. On the right is the radio um, polarization. And you can see even by eye that the polarized intensities are peaking at different locations in the galaxy. The radio is tracing a, a hot super bubble. The uh, far infrared is tracing more uh, denser, colder gas. And I can overlay the geometries that we infer from these two tracers on the same uh, image so that you can see that the magnetic field in black traced by the far infrared is different in orientation than these white lines that are tracing the radio polarization. If I choose only the pixels where the, we have measurements of both the far infrared and the radio polarization, we find that the distribution of the polarization angle shown here on the right is totally different between these two tracers, indicating that the magnetic fields that are being traced are in separate locations, separate phases of the ISM. Not only this, but if you compare the statistics of the polarization fraction for this galaxy uh, as a function of the total column density or equivalently the total luminosity of the far infrared, you find different statistical properties than the spiral galaxy M51 that we saw before. The radio in particular shows a lower polarization indicating more tangled magnetic fields than in the spiral galaxy. And the anti-correlation of the far infrared uh, polarization fraction with column uh, remains, but is in detail a little bit different as well. In general, understanding and mapping this, these statistical properties to actual um, energy balances in the ISM is a complicated task, and we need simulations to be able to translate what these observables are telling us about the ISM of galaxies. So this is part of what we've been starting to do. Um, there are a number of simulations out there that now include magnetic fields and cosmic rays and follow their evolution uh, with the evolution of an entire galaxy. On the right, I'm showing you one example of a simulated Milky Way type galaxy from the suite of fire simulations. The colors are showing you the balance, the ratio between the magnetic pressure and the cosmic ray pressure. And you can see that in this uh, map, the ratio of these two pressures changes with location in the galaxy. We're hoping to use these simulations and forward model them to produce the same observables and compare one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to understand what in detail the statistics are telling us about the ISM and magnetic fields in these media. So I will conclude um, by telling you that cosmic magnetism is a growing field. There is a lot of observations giving us new and exciting data for magnetic fields in our own Milky Way and other galaxies. And there's an equally um, important push from the theory side to produce improved computing capabilities and numerical methods to be able to compare with the observations and make sense of them. The uh, next decade is even brighter. We expect even bigger data to come our way with the SKA that's gonna be able to detect magnetic fields throughout uh, the universe at very, very uh, early times as well. I would like to briefly mention that we're advertising for a PhD position on interstellar magnetic fields at Chalmers. So if you have uh, a student that might be interested in this, um, let them contact me, or you can look at the Chalmers Vacancies website. The summary of my talk is here. Um, we're excited to map the magnetic field geometry of uh, our own Milky Way and other galaxies for uh, a number of di different reasons. There's a lot of data and new methods that are being developed to allow us to create the first 3D reconstruction of the magnetic field in the Milky Way. And we can improve the magnetic field constraints in other galaxies by comparing uh, these new kinds of observables with uh, simulations. And I will end there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Zina. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. We clearly have some time for questions. 
So uh, those who are interested to ask a question, maybe they could raise their hand. Yes, I also am not able to look at the chat. So if there are questions yeah. in the chat, just read them out to me. Yeah, Thank you. we'll do. Uh, while people are warming up, maybe I can ask you a couple of questions. The first one you, you showed in your early slides about the energy densities and how everything seems to be around one EV per uh, cubic centimeter, right? Yeah. This looks very much like a conspiracy theory to me. It is as if, you know, I mean, I can understand that there may be something which is related to, say, magnetic energy and cosmic rays per se, or, or somehow even the turbulent part, just because of the coupling that there is with the magnetic field of kinematics. But uh, the, the thermal, which is, uh, I presume, uh, dust, which is heated by... Uh, the a, thermal a, is, is the hot ionized gas. The hot ionized gas. Uh, it is a bit surprising that is the case, right? I mean, you showed that yeah. one of them, I forget which one, was fairly flat. Yeah, so uh, this this is the plot that right. um, you're mentioning, right? The, the cosmic rays are flat. Uh, they're not very correlated with the density structure. Uh, that's because they're very diffusive in their propagation. Um, and I think that, yeah, especially the thermal, um, the thermal aspect of this is is really a coincidence. You can see that as a function of density, you know, the balance is is totally off. Uh, it just happens that. Um, at these specific mean densities of the ISM of a few particles per cc, all these lines match. Um, you're right that the, the turbulent energy and the magnetic energy are related because we know that um, turbulent motions can induce uh, and amplify magnetic field. So there's, if you're talking about the turbulent dynamo, uh, a specific fraction of that turbulent kinetic energy goes into magnetic energy. Um, so there is that. And, now, why the cosmic rays and the magnetic field are of the same order of magnitude and energy density in the local ISM, I, I do not know. I have to think more about that. Yeah, it, is a, you know, it could be as if there is a bias that uh, if we, if we want to compare those, if we, are measure, if, if we can only measure those four in the same, in a, in a few, in a, you know, in select places where they directly correlate, that may be one reason, right? I mean, yeah, this is a very measurement, yeah. right? It's it's only solar circle in the mid plane. Yeah, it's, there are many criteria. Yeah. And uh, the towards the end of your talk, since I don't see any other hands, I will keep on bubbling. You discussed about the polarization measured in uh, using uh, far infrared emission, right? And then uh, radio, and uh, you showed the anti-correlation, anti right? And I think at some point, some, yeah, here you say, for example, the far infrared is associated with dense gaseous disk, right? Uh, you know, the work that, I was under the impression, for example, that when we trace far infrared emission, typically this was more closely associated with cold, uh, diffuse H1 uh, emission, right? From spin flip transition, while the warmer dust uh, was more closely associated with PDR regimes, right? So yes. if, uh, so... This, the amount of far infrared is correlated with the dust density. So it's primarily tracing the dense cold gas. Yeah. yeah. So, so in essence, I would, it would be interesting, but on the other hand, if you, if you measure polarization on the base in the radio continuum, that's what you do, right? Radio continuum emission, that uh, clearly, this is the more, the more energetic areas of the galaxy, right? So ideally you would like to use SKA or another tracer to see if you could uh, somehow measure polarization in the spin flip transition, for example, uh, of mm. atomic gas, right? The uh, Zeeman effects. Yeah, that, that's not going to give us geometry, that, but it is going to give us strength, yes. Okay. yes. So, uh, so the this, uh, th this lack of correlation, do you attribute it to the fact that uh, you basically see a projection effect and uh, the radio is, and this projection effect is strong even in phase on spirals? It appears to be for the dense gas, at least. Uh, that's uh, anti correlated with the column density and the top left panel, yes. So as you go to um, higher column densities, there's more. Um, 
more tangledness along the line of sight. The structure of the magnetic field is less and less ordered, um, presumably because you know you have um, also gravity taking over at some point. Um, at, whereas the radio isn't tracing really these denser, colder regions. It's, it's weighted by the density of the cosmic electrons that are more volume filling than uh, just the cold dense gas. And uh, do you think that there would be areas in our galaxy where you could do select lines of sight where you could you you could test uh, this anti-correlation again? You mean where where you have more means to actually disentangle it, right? Because you were, you will also have the probable or wallop measurements. Yeah, so in our galaxy, we'll be probing very different scales. It's going to be very hard to, on scales of hundreds or more, or, you know, a KPC is, is uh, currently unreachable. Okay. I, see, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oops. Uh, hold on a sec. I don't know. Yes. Okay. I don't know if there is any other question. I don't see any hands raised. Everything was extremely clear. Or just too boring. Or just uh, too complicated. Uh, magnetic fields were always uh, challenging. So. Uh, sorry, I, ha I have a question. Oh, okay. Uh, can, you, can, can you hear me? Yes, Alexander. Yes, go ahead, Alexander. Okay. So uh, my question is that Usually, when we have when we open up the third dimension, uh, what we basically will get is local measurements of the plane of the sky component of the magnetic field of its orientation, right? For the topographic so, method, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, the uh, I would be interested in knowing how well we can constrain the line of sight uh, component and what methods uh, currently exist. Oh, I mean, generally, it's a very open question. But um, I mean, how, what? How can we constrain the line of sight component so that we can perhaps uh, try to to infer the geometry of the magnetic field better? Uh, like uh, Zeeman measurements, for instance, are are one option, but uh, these are presumably very hard to 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 get by. So th the question is, how, what what can we use? Uh, we have Faraday maps. Uh, what, what, how? Um, optimistic can we be about also getting a good approximation of the line of sight component wherever we have local measurements in the plane of the sky? Yes, so uh, you're right. The Zeeman measurement is going to give you the line of sight uh, component of the, magnet, of the magnetic field for this dense cold medium that's also traced by the dust uh, emission and the starlight polarization. The, the Faraday rotation is going to trace the ionized medium. So it's it's a separate magnetic field, presumably. Um, if, if we take at least the other galaxy uh, results, we're seeing that the magnetic fields in the two different media are can be very different. So if you want to trace the line of sight component in the cold medium, Zeeman is your best bet. But as we know, Zeeman is very hard to measure. Um, so you can have some incomplete information from the stellar polar imagery and or the dust emission because there is this dependence of the uh, polarization of this mechanism on the line of sight inclination. So in principle, in the diffuse ISM, the, if you don't have uh, tangledness along the line of sight, the amount of polarization is going to trace how inclined the magnetic field is with respect to the plane of the sky. Um, and uh, this, this, this inclination effect is also uh, wavelength dependent. And I can talk more about that uh, offline if you want. So um, in principle, I think that looking at multi-wavelength observations of the stellar polarization can inform you about the inclination of the magnetic field. You don't get a direction. You don't get a point. But um, you know. It's not a vector, it's a, still a segment, but at least you have some extra information on the 3D vector there. Did that answer okay, your okay. question? Yeah, yeah, I did. Thank you very much. And also, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. OK, since I don't see any other hands, uh, I would like to thank uh, Zina once more. Wish you all the best in your new career. 
as a professor up north, and you are always very welcome to the warm climate of the southern Europe. Thank you very much. Bye, your new year. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.